Hello, in this project I'm going to be building a serving tray to a design that I've been thinking about for a while. I'm going to use some wood that I've reclaimed and I've had lurking around for a while now. For the frame of the tray I'm going to use this pine. It originally comes from a bed frame that some friend of humanity had fly tipped in an area of woodland near where I live. I tidied up the mess and brought the wood home with plans to use it for something one day. For the handle I'm going to use this hardwood that was originally used as a curtain pole. First of all I'm cleaning up the pine. I'm using my number 4 smoothing plane to take off the surface and to smooth everything down. I'll finish off using a card scraper to get everything nice and smooth. I'm taking off a small section from the end of the board to remove the screw hole. I can leave the screw hole at the other end as this will be hidden by the handle. Next I mark out so I get one end and one side of the tray from each piece of pine. I cut these pieces together to make sure they're absolutely uniform. I'm just checking that I can hide that screw hole when I put the handle in later on. So I'm marking up roughly just to get an idea. And I roughly mark up the position of one of the end pieces to get an idea for the size. I've decided that I'm going to pitch the sides and ends of the tray in at 15 degrees. So I set the chop saw up to 15 degrees and cut off both ends from the ends of the tray. I'll save the little triangular sections that I cut off, as these will come in very useful later. I transfer the 15 degree angle to my sliding bevel so that I can mark up the angle for the mortises on the sides of the tray. I mark up one angle using the bevel position the end to get the width and give it a mark and then I'll do the final mark with the bevel. And that'll go together something like that. I'm marking the depth of the mortise that I'm going to cut on the end piece. and I'm labelling up which piece goes where. I do this because even though I try and cut accurately, I find that I will be cutting to the job and so there will be some small variants. Next I'm going to transfer the marks into knife marks using the knife and the sliding bevel. This gives me a guide to chisel too. And then marking in where the top of the tenon goes. I start by removing the material in front of the knife mark. 
I want to chisel down along the knife mark and unless I remove this material the bevel on the chisel will force the chisel back into the wood and make the mortise wider than I really want it. With that material removed I can now chisel along the knife mark knowing full well that the chisel will actually be going down exactly where the knife mark was placed. I now start cutting along the length of the mortise to remove the material in the middle and then slice in from the side. I'll repeat this process until I get down to depth. I could completely finish the mortise just using the chisel. But I have a router plane so I can set this to the correct depth and then I can make sure that every mortise is uniform. And that fits nice and snug. I then cut away the top of the tenon. This will allow the end piece to butt up completely against the side piece and hide the joinery from anyone looking from above, giving a neat finish to the tray. and that fits in like so. I then repeat the process for the other three mortises. And that's the joinery for the frame complete and the frame dry fitted. This is the plywood I'm going to use for the base of the tray. In order to fit the base I'm going to cut a recess into the sides and ends of the tray using the table saw and I'm just marking the depth here. This cut also has to be made at 15 degrees because the base of the tray is not square on to the sides and the edges. I have to make a couple of passes on the table saw adjusting the fence as I go because the kerf of the saw is not as wide as the thickness of the plywood. Next I measure up for the dimensions of the ply. I do this by using a steel ruler and inserting it into the depth of the recess, measuring along and allowing an extra couple of millimetres. I don't want the plywood to be a complete tight fit, I want there to be some room for the expansion and contraction of the frame. I'm now going to do the shaping on the sides of the tray and to do this I'm going to fix both sides together so that I can do the job at the same time and get them to match perfectly. I do this by using some double sided tape.
With the two sides taped together I can treat them as one job. First of all I'm going to mark the position of the holes I need to take the handle. Having marked the distance in from the top and the size, I use the square to find the intersection point. Having measured on the one side, I use the marking gauge to transfer those measurements to the other side. I use a centre punch to mark the centre of the hole to be drilled. I have a 35mm Forstner bit which is the same diameter as the pole. My pillar drill wasn't serviceable at the time so I'm going to use a hand drill to bore the hole. I use my engineer's square to give myself a visual reference to ensure that I bore the hole perpendicular. Apologies for essentially filming my arm rather than the drilling process here. And I just test the pole in there, it fits great. And I repeat the process at the other end. The next step is to shape the end of the sides of the tray. I'm going to sketch in the curve I want by eye. I use a coping saw to get the basic shape. This kind of job would be great for a band saw, but I didn't have one available at the time. I use a rounded rasp to remove more material to carry on the curve. The rasp is quite savage and doesn't leave a particularly smooth surface. So I refine the curve further with a finer file. I then use a succession of grades of sandpaper to refine things further until I get a nice smooth curve. With this done I need to separate the two pieces of wood from the sticky tape. I found the sticky tape I used was a little more sticky than I anticipated. It left this rather sticky residue. I was able to peel a lot of it off but for the more stubborn pieces I used some thinners. Next I'm using the cut piece as a pattern for the other side. Having marked those up I stick the two pieces together again and repeat the process with the coping saw, the rasp, the file and then the sandpaper. I'll take this opportunity to give the frame a sanding as things get more difficult once I start constructing it. Okay. 
I then measure up to get a basic distance for the length I need for the handles. And I'll cut these to size. The next step is to glue up the frame. I put glue on all of the mating surfaces of one of the sides and then on one of the edges of the two ends. and I start fitting together. With one side and two ends in position, I can slide in the base of the tray. I then glue up the other side. I'm gluing the base in only on one side. That's a compromise to hopefully stop the base rattling around but to still allow some room for expansion and contraction of the wood. With everything in position I'm now going to clamp up and this is where those triangular pieces that I kept from earlier come in really useful. By inverting them I can cancel out the 15 degree angle and allow my clamps to clamp in a straight line and thus provide even pressure. I put a couple more clamps over the top of the tray to ensure that's even clamping pressure right over the side. Next I need to sort out the handles and for this I'm going to need some small pieces with a 15 degree angle on. So I've left that for a day and it's ready to unclamp. So back to the handles. Because of the 15 degree angle I can't simply put the pole straight through. So those small pieces with the 15 degree angle I've used to cancel out the angle of the sides of the tray so that I can put a straight piece of the pole across the gap. I'm now going to glue that all in position.
Cutting at a 15 degree angle across the pole causes an end section which is an ellipse. So it's important at this stage that I make the widest point of the ellipse perpendicular with the vertical. Where the ellipse meets the round section of the pole, there'll be a slight difference in the area of the cross section. But if I line this along with the top, I can key the excess at the bottom in with sandpaper. And I glue that up once again using the triangular sections. I'm not willing to trust an end-to-end -end glue joint alone, so I'm going to screw from the end cap into the main body of the handle. I find the centre and centre punch. I'm drilling a hole large enough for the screw to pass through in the end cap. I then drill a smaller pilot hole that goes into the meat of the handle. Using the countersink bit, I recess the hole as deep as I can. I want the screw to be well inset from the end of the cap. I cut off the excess with a flush saw. and then neaten off and remove any excess with a chisel. I'm now going to make some end caps to cover the screws. I'm covering a bit of pole in masking tape to help stop tear out. And I'm also using a hacksaw rather than a tenon saw because when using the tenon saw I seem to get a lot of chipping and tear out. Next I want to do something about those gaps left by the recess I cut for the base. I've got some spare pieces of pine here which I'm putting a 15 degree angle in the end and then I'll slide into the recess, glue in and shape to cover up the hole. I just use the plane to get this width nearer the finished width before I glue in. I clamp that up and let it dry.
I'm giving the handle a good old sanding to get it nice and smooth and also to key in the differential where the ellipse meets the round section. Now that the plugs are all glued in position, I'll remove the excess with a chisel. I use a chisel to carve the end of the plug so that it matches the curve of the end of the tray. and then pair off any excess on the inside. And finally use sandpaper to make sure everything is completely flush. And that's it with the plugs fitted. Okay, the sides are final sanding at this point because after I put the caps on to hide the screws, sanding straight across will be a little bit more difficult. I'm just going to glue these caps on. And once again, use my little triangles. And that's the construction of the tray complete. It's time to give it a good sanding all over before finishing. Poles originally had a reddish tinge to the finish which I quite liked but I lost a lot of that due to the sanding. So I decided I'd put this red colour back. I found some red wood stain varnish left over from the build of the conservatory and so I thought this would be an ideal thing to use on the handles. First of all, I'm just making some masks to stop the varnish getting on the sides of the tray. I just apply this with a brush. I make sure I'm always brushing along the length of the handle. And then I paint the end caps. And that's what it looks like when the varnish is dry. I took quite some time wondering about how I might finish the rest of the tray and decided I might like to add a picture, like so. The image is transferred from a simple laser print and you can see how I did this in one of my other videos. I'm using a sprayed glass varnish to finish the tray 
Firstly to protect the picture and secondly because I wanted to make sure I had a finish that was going to be resistant to spillages, the, the types of liquids that might get carried on a tray. And this is the finished piece. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, press like and please subscribe to the channel for more projects.